is the hot zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. I've had this map of Afghanistan hanging on the wall of my office for almost 15 years. And in that time period, I have been all over Afghanistan to just about, I think I've been to every province in Afghanistan on about a dozen trips over there. I've spent a good year or more of my life on the ground in Afghanistan reporting on the war. And I would venture to say that it's the one place where I have done the most war reporting uh, more than anywhere else. And today's a historic day because Afghanistan, for the first time since 2001, no longer has an American flag flying over that nation. Today, uh, the, uh, this is Sunday, the embassy has been evacuated, the ambassador has flown out, scenes reminiscent of Vietnam, and Saigon in 1975, and the, the evacuation of the embassy then. Uh, actually, there's a lot of incredible similarities um, between those two uh, events. Uh, even the imagery is very similar. We see the Taliban retaking control in Afghanistan surprisingly quickly, and saying that they're going to uh, create a new nation. The president of Afghanistan, the duly elected president, has fled, gone to Uzbekistan or someplace, and is no longer there. So the, 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 the elected government is no longer in control in Afghanistan. It is now under the control of the Taliban. America uh, is, is sending troops back in in order to help evacuate the people, the few people that we have left in that country. But those troops won't stay long. Uh, 6,000 troops now required to go in and evacuate 100 embassy staff and, and that sort of thing. Um, because if we didn't send those many troop, that, that many troops in, the airport would be overrun, the embassy would be overrun, and both of those soon will be as soon as our troops get our people out. And we will have uh, watched full circle as Afghanistan went from a nation controlled by an unelected government, the Taliban, to again being controlled by the Taliban. This is something that the Taliban themselves foretold uh, many years ago at the beginning of the war. They said uh, the Americans, the Brits, the Germans, the French, the Italians, they're all here, and they all have very nice timepieces. But we, only we, the Taliban, have the time. And what they meant was that they can wait. They could wait us out, and that the minute we left, they would declare victory. But the question is, are they actually victorious in the war in Afghanistan? See, I believe that we actually won the war. And I'll talk more about that in just a second. One of the first things you need to know about doing laundry in the field under these field conditions is that every soldier, sailor, airman, and marine needs a laundry bag. Second, everyone makes the mistake of too little rinse time. You have to use the right fabric softener and the right amount of rinse. Then, the important thing is a dryer sheet of which we seem to be, oh, Wait a second, I think I may have one right here. The proper kind of dryer sheet that you need to make sure that your laundry is static free and easy to fold. We'll have more on that in our next installment. So today is the 500th episode of The Hot Zone. Unbelievable, mind boggling. And I had big plans for making a special commemorative edition of the hot zone for the 500th uh, episode. But just like always in this line of work, 
events on the ground have necessitated otherwise. And so with this historic event taking place in Afghanistan, someplace where I've just, I've spent so much time, I've invested so much of life, my life I've actually talked about buying property there because I was there so much. Watching what's happening in Afghanistan is an absolute travesty. There's no doubt about that. But the question is, did we lose the war? Well, my assertion is that we won the war, but the war ended long ago. Uh, the war actually ended only about two months after it began. You see, uh, after the September 11th attacks on the United States that were uh, training was, was done by Al-Qaeda at camps in Afghanistan, uh, then President George W. Bush uh, gave an ultimatum to the Taliban that they would turn over Osama bin Laden, who was responsible for the attacks on September 11th. And if not, that bombs would be coming. Now, the Taliban actually said that they would turn over Osama bin Laden, but not to the Americans. They said they would turn them over to a uh, neutral third country. But that wasn't good enough for us, rightfully so. And so the bombs fell on Kandahar and Kabul and many other places. Uh, the Taliban, we, we sent in special forces troops on October 7th, 2001. Uh, the fighting began and we, we hooked up with the Northern Alliance, an anti-Taliban group of uh, warlords and fighters. And we showed up with... Uh, several dozen special forces troops, a few CIA guys, and a couple of suitcases full of money. And we used the Northern Alliance forces uh, and then augmented them with our special operations troops and with uh, air support, which was very helpful. And in the space of two months, about two months, by the first couple weeks of December, uh, the Taliban had fallen. The Taliban rule in Afghanistan was over, a transitional government was in place, the Taliban was gone. Uh, not gone, but gone from government in Afghanistan. Then the war was over. We won. And it only took several dozen special forces troops and some air power and a couple suitcases of money, and it was done. We had very, very few casualties, just, a, just two or three casualties, uh, I mean deaths, uh, starting with Johnny Mike Spann, the CIA operative that was killed, uh, it was the first American casualty in Afghanistan. Uh, and then a couple of uh, special operators that were casualties of actually friendly fire. But other than that, we didn't lose a whole lot of guys. And the war was over. We defeated the Taliban by December-ish, December 7th or so of 2001. So then why didn't we just pack up and leave Afghanistan and leave them to their own devices. See, what happened at that point was no longer war. It was an attempt to turn Afghanistan into something that it will never be, something that it could never be, some sort of approximation of a Jeffersonian democracy. And at that, after nearly 20 years, trillions of dollars spent, almost a billion dollars a week spent for 20 years, pumped into that country, pumped into projects like hydroelectric plants and bridges and roads and uh, electrical, uh, micro hydro, you know, that sort of thing. Um, pumped into literacy programs and building programs, schools and, and things like that. Things that don't really qualify as warfare. Uh, now, there was plenty of fighting because the Taliban started an insurgency and Al-Qaeda was still around. So there was plenty of people to shoot and plenty of people to shoot back. But in reality, the war, was, the war had already been decided. The war was over. What was happening was a violent... Uh, it, it was an, an attempt to create a Jeffersonian democracy that was beset by violence, because the people we were trying to give a Jeffersonian democracy to didn't want it. 
They didn't want it. They weren't capable of it. When we walked into Afghanistan, they have some, had something like a 17% literacy rate. They had a, like a 47-year life expectancy. Now, those things have all changed. We've managed to improve life expectancy. Uh, we've managed to improve education. We've managed to improve the lot of women. But one thing we never did was defeat the ignorance that is latent, that is endemic to the culture in Afghanistan. We didn't do that. And in reality, we couldn't do that. That's something that only the Afghans can do. They have to want it, and they didn't want it. And so you can't force education on people. You can't force civilization on barbarians. You just can't. And I just not, don't hear me saying that only Afghans are barbarians. There's lots of barbarians in our own country. Uh, just look at the Black Lives Matter movement and Antifa. Those are barbarians, without a doubt. And you can't force them to be civilized. Uh, you can put enough controls on them. You can, you know, kill them. You can put controls on them to try to uh, keep them from acting barbarically. But in reality, you're not going to turn a barbarian into a noble savage. Uh, there's just no such thing. And only when their hearts change will their culture change. So from 2002 to nearly 2022, the United States tried very hard to, and spent a lot of money and a lot of blood and a lot of sweat and a lot of tears trying to turn Afghanistan into something it could never be. But the war had already been won. The war against the Taliban. Now, what we did by pumping so much money into Afghanistan is we actually resuscitated the Taliban. We actually brought them back to life. At some point during the war or, or during that, that intervening period of uh, 2002 to 2021, uh, we were pumping so much money into projects in Afghanistan that the Taliban were actually skimming maybe up to about 15% of those budgets and using it to keep themselves going. Now, what we see today as the United States starts to pull out is uh, hordes of Taliban fighters moving across Afghanistan and retaking all the provincial capitals, and now they've retaken Kabul. And you might wonder, like, where did all these people come from? I mean, why didn't we kill all these people when we had the chance? Well, that's because they weren't Taliban until just now. The vast majority of them were the same people that were very happy to have Americans there. And they were. They were legitimately happy that the Americans were there. They were happy with our money that we pumped into that country. They were happy with what we were doing. But... In that culture, they follow the strong horse. And so they want to be on the winning side. And, uh, you know, scruples, uh, principles, things like that, not quite as important as being a part of the winning team. So now that it looks like the Taliban is the winning team, they have every available male in the country lining up to join the Taliban. And this is something that any reasonably intelligent human being could have seen coming a long time ago. I started to say in about 2009 that we were going to end up losing this war because the bottom line was that no matter what we did in Afghanistan, we could turn that place into Dubai. The moment we left, the Taliban would stand up and claim victory. And they told us as much. They told us they would do that. So now we see the President Biden pulling troops out of Afghanistan precipitously without much of a plan. Just get them out. And you know that there wasn't much of a plan because if there had been a plan, we wouldn't have to send them right back in to try to safeguard the ones that we're pulling out. But if you think about it, with nearly 6,000 troops in Afghanistan, it's about 3,000 on the ground now and 3,000 more coming. 6,000 troops is, F is more than we had for the first couple of years of the war, uh, you know, there were something like 5,700, 5,800 troops 
there in 2003, 4, 5, it was only when the surge happened that we started uh, the surge in Iraq that we had an Afghan surge and we started uh, increasing the numbers there uh, to somewhere in the 100, 150,000 range. What, one thing you have to understand though is that in Afghanistan, uh, most of the work lately over the last, like say five, six, seven, eight, nine years, has been done by contractors, not U.S. troops. So when we say we we're pulling all our troops out, there's still a bunch of contractors there, and those contractors are scrambling. They're trying to get out. So as we watch the absolute debacle of the pullout in Afghanistan unfolding before us, we have to remember that we won the war. We lost the peace. That's all I've got for today. Welcome to the 500th episode of The Hot Zone. It's amazing what has uh, transpired with this podcast. We're up into uh, over 8,000 subscribers on YouTube alone, um, which surprises me because I don't dance around in my underwear, I don't have cleavage, and therefore uh, I shouldn't really have much interest at all on, uh, on YouTube or, or as a podcast. But there are a lot of people who like the idea of following me on my travels as I go around the world and, uh, and report on hot zones everywhere and then give you a chance to help the people that we meet. See, we don't just make the news. We make the news better. I'm Chuck Holton. Thanks for watching Hot Zone. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2021.